Uh, at Palantir, we've spent the best part of two decades tackling some of the world's most formidable data integration challenges alongside our customers. From aerospace to manufacturing and healthcare, we've seen the same core data systems over and over again. SAP, Oracle, Salesforce, and so on. Common ERPs and CRMs have become ubiquitous across industries. Each time we encounter one of these systems, we need to deploy a team of engineers or our customers do, or our partners do, to write custom code to extract, clean, and transform the underlying data into something that can actually be used for analytics or for decision making. Instead of continuing to reinvent the wheel and west, uh, wasting precious resources, we developed a capability that we call HyperAuto. HyperAuto utilizes uh, what we kind of coin as software-defined data integration to expedite the process of getting data out of these systems and into a usable form. So our partners can use their data for valuable use cases as quickly as possible. The key to HyperAuto automation is the ability to use the metadata within the ERP or the CRM system to inform how to transform the data. This metadata contains important information about the data and how it's structured, so users can quickly understand what they're looking at and find the information they need to solve the problem at hand. We kind of give two ways to explore this data before actually ingesting it. First uh, is biological module. So these can be like uh, CRM, financial accounting, material management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really easy for me to find one of our, like the common tables within an SRP, uh, SAP system, Mara, and quickly understand kind of all the information about this table. Uh, and most importantly, the relationships that this table has with other information within the ERP itself. Uh, what's really important to note here is it, we're not predefining any of this relate, uh, any of this information. None of the column namings, none of the relationships that Mara has with other, uh, other information within the system. We're utilizing the metadata that's within these ERPs to actually derive this for us and actually also derive data pipelines for us as well. The other way to kind of look at this is like, hey, I wanna go solve a problem. I wanna go look at proactive customer service. So I wanna identify sales orders that are gonna be disrupted because of late process orders or pr production orders or purchase orders so that I can be more proactive with my customers and what's going on within my supply chain or with my vendors. The one we'll focus on today is supply chain disruption. So in this case, again, we've done these use cases a number of time with our partners across industries. And so we can say in order to do this type of use case, which is looking at raw materials and then being able to kind of find shortages and understand the impacts on sales orders and customers, and then find ways in which we can actually like try and fix these things. We kind of bundle all the tables that are needed from the underlying ERP into this concept of a use case and then extract it uh, and transform it and harmonize it, but also then apply downstream templates to get it into a further form to go do this type of use case. And ultimately what this produces is a data pipeline. What we're looking at here is a data lineage graph. Um, kind of each box represents a data set and the lines between those boxes are transformation dependencies. With HyperAuto, the cool thing is that I don't have to write any code to be able to build a pipeline like this. I can select the use case that I'm gonna do, and ultimately what uh, HyperAuto will do, will, will one, uh, automatically in, uh, generate the dynamic code to actually bring this data in and get it into a usable form, and then apply any downstream transformations that are necessary to go and actually do this use case to get it into kind of what we call ontology or a semantic layer that makes sense based on the underlying data. So things that are familiar to a business like plants and customers and customer material demand. And so the other cool thing that, that Hyper, what HyperAuto does here is uh, we kind of track the provenance of every data set within the platform and the transformation that logic that was applied to it to get it into its current form. So at any point in this pipeline, I can kind of, if I wanna drill into one of these data sets, I can get a preview of what the data looks like at that particular part of the data pipeline, as well as the code that was used to generate uh, this, this piece of data from all the inputs uh, across the different ERP system. And this is kind of what we need in terms of like a white box approach, meaning that like 
we are one going to generate all the transformation logic that gets the data ready for the use case um, using the metadata within the ERP itself. And then we have templates to then kind of lay on top of this data to get it into further form, more useful form to actually go and generate, uh, you know, the, the, the correct kind of form for, for, this, for, for this particular use case. And then on top of that, I can pop it open into a kind of a, a more of a, a code repository type of setting to enhance it or change it based on the nuance of my business that I want to include um, into this pipeline. So that's a little bit about like HyperAuto. The, the cool thing about this is after being able to connect to an underlying ERP system or multiple ERP systems, a pipeline like this can be generated uh, in days. Um, mostly like the thing, the stick in the mud is gonna be like data transfer, being able to extract it from the underlying ERP uh, and then ultimately then building out this, this pipeline is I have all kind of the data sets that I need to go and understand this data sets. And, and then I'll kind of zoom in on what this use case is specifically doing. So at the top, these blue boxes are kind of where we're taking all that data from the ERP and coming up with a very granular understanding of the inventory of different materials at different locations on different dates uh, across kind of plants or locations uh, within the business. So if I just open up the inventory daily KPI data set, I think this is a really good example where uh, we produce kind of like every row here is a material and a plant and a date, both looking into the past as well as looking into the future based on like planned purchase orders or process orders or stock transfer orders to understand inventory value, quantity, consumption value, consumption quantity, inflows, nets, safety stock, things like that. Versus the bottom part of this pipeline is kind of looking at the bill of materials and saying, hey, I want to look at my customer demand coming in the, the form of sales orders. And I want to be able to take that customer demand, both the revenue associated with those sales orders, as well as the physical demand for final goods, and to be able to kind of traverse that back through my bill of, bill of materials at every layer of my bill of materials, both final, intermediate, uh, and raw, so that it's really easy to compare apples to apples to say, what do I have? in terms of my inventory, both in the past as well in the future, for every material at every plant uh, at every given day, as well as what's the, the demand for this material driven from sales orders through every kind of component within my bill of materials. And ultimately all of this kind of data is then flowing into this like simplistic model, the simplistic data model that kind of describes uh, this particular supply chain or a generic kind of supply chain so I'm able to, to flow all that data into common nouns and verbs and how they're connected between customers and plants and material dependencies and purchase orders and sales orders, kind of common nouns and verbs. One recent partner in the heavy manufacturing space, they were able to build out this foundation in the matter of one week. Um, Hyper Auto provides a huge acceleration to value. So your organization can start focusing on actually solving this problem rather than like integrating, getting all the data together for months or potentially years to go and try and solve this problem. Contour is a low code, no code analytical tool. The way this is like for kind of like Excel jockeys that get frustrated by, you know, a million row limitations of Excel and they want to be able to do these types of kind of interactions with, it, with data at scale. So the way that you can think about using Contour is I can configure visualizations and I can configure filters to kind of understand the data and continue to drill down into data to answer certain types of questions. So with this particular data set, I want to find all of the troubling kind of like materials and plants that are getting into trouble where like the inventory quantity is starting to, to fall under safety stock, under minimum safety stock, or into like zero or negative territory where there's a backlog um, dependent upon like unfulfilled purchase orders. I'm going to go ahead and get a quick preview of the data just to make sure I'm looking at um, the thing I want to look at. Yep, the same data set. Uh, and then I'm going to start to filter down to rows that kind of meet these types of conditions. So I could do a filter, um, but I'm going to use our expression board to kind of type out a little bit more complicated of, um, uh, of a filter here. So I'm going to do a library, do a filter. 
And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look for when my minimum safety stock is above zero. I kind of want to look at you know clean data here. Um, and then I want to look at when my inventory quantity is less than my minimum safety stock. Uh, so we can go ahead and apply. And I go down from what I was starting at of around 2.3 million rows of data down to 362 rows. If I want to get another preview of what this data looks like, I can just use my table widget to kind of get a preview and kind of see the materials and plants. To get a better understanding, I'm going to use what we call our grid um, board to kind of see which materials and plants are the worst offenders. So I'll put my material on my y-axis, my plants on my uh, my y, sorry, x-axis, and then kind of get a count of those combinations. So over here, I can see all my plants, Denver, Moline, uh, Milwaukee, Shenandoah. And then on the bottom, I can see the problematic materials at those plants, axles, flank screws, hoods, metal plates. And then I get a kind of color coding of which combinations are the worst offenders. Up at the top right hand corner, I can see that the spring locking pin at my Denver location is the worst offender. So I can just actually click on that square and this is automatically gonna put a, uh, a filter or condition of how I wanna like filter down on this data. So my next question might, might be like, how has this like material at this plant kind of looked over time? So what I'm gonna do really quickly is I'm just gonna quickly duplicate this analysis. And then instead of kind of looking for these troublesome you know, like instances or days when inventory is less than my minimum safety stock. And then I'm just going to configure a quick chart to see what this looks like over time. So here I can kind of see the blue line is my inventory quantity. The uh, green line is my minimum, my safety stock. And then my red line is my minimum safety stock. So again, if I kind of think about my inventory quantity as a general ledger over time of like additions and of subtractions of, um, of this quantity of the spring locking pin at Denver, I can definitely see that over time I'm getting into a lot of trouble. And there's actually an instance kind of in, in March, uh, late February, early March, where I'm actually falling um, under, uh, under zero, going into negative quantity, which means like there's a backlog of this material. There are, are pending uh, production orders and process orders and sales orders that are not being met because I don't have that material at this particular plant to actually go make those things. So this is highly problematic. I could expect that there's gonna be a loss of production utilization, a loss of, of delivery utilization and truck capacity, uh, not only a, a loss of kind of like the impact on my customers and not being able to deliver the items that I wanna to deliver to them uh, at the date that I promised them. Uh, just to kind of rehash what I went through, uh, I know I just went through uh, a ton, but I was able to kind of like set up a pipeline uh, for a particular workflow using HyperAuto to quickly get data out of an ERP and, and kind of quickly transform it into this like usable semantic layer. I was enabled to kind of like interrogate a data set and start to understand what's happening within that data um, and, and what's happening within my supply chain from an inventory perspective. What it really does is it takes in that semantic layer of, you know, how does everything in the supply chain connect from uh, the hand of the supplier to the hand of the customer? And then layer on top of it, the common models and KPIs and, and, and aspects that we track as supply chain experts. So these are things like your on time in full or your inventory timeline. How is that going to look out into the future or really anything else that you know, we see commonly across supply chains um, that we can connect straight to? On top of that, then applications. So how do we start to interact with and drive our supply chain in a proactive you know, forward looking manner so that it's, you know, not just analytics, but it's operations and actions and decisions and bringing all of these things together. So I'm going to pop open my screen share right now, my supply chain archetype. And so what you see here is kind of that next level under the hood of the different applications that an operator can quickly use to drive their supply chain. And I'm going to dig in specifically to that uh, locking pin that Danny just brought up because he noticed that he's seeing out of stock events into the future. So how can we take that same analytics that he's created and create alerts and then resolve the alerts when these events occur? So what you see here is kind of my business user 
facing application that allows me to quickly alert on what badness looks like in my supply chain. But what you can see here is actually one of the, the tools here is this import from Contour. And so this actually enables me to take Danny's analytics and operationalize it with the click of a button. And I won't go into every detail of what the alert is doing, but at a high level, I'll show you some aspects. You know, we're filtering down our inventory timelines. This is what's our inventory doing out in the future. And, you know, we're just doing some, you know, basic stuff. We're focusing on the next 60 days, for example, because, you know, maybe that's, you know, our operational timeline. Um, but as I, you know, kind of, um, you know, take a look at this, what you'll notice is that much of the um, you know, logic that you see here, it really is the same kind of logic that you would have available to you in, in other tools you're familiar with, but with the power of the underlying ontology. And once I've created this alert, what I have at hand is automatically an alert inbox that allows me to resolve the work, um, the alert in an optimal way. So if I filter down to the high level alerts, so these are the most critical alerts in my organization, we'll see that in fact, that same spring locking pin that Danny brought up, we have a high priority alert that's impacting almost $30,000 of sales at Plant Denver. So my immediate question as kind of a supply chain operator is how can I go and solve this problem and take action? And when I jump into my kind of um, you know, operational tool here, what we can see is that I have everything at hand to now make an informed decision. So I filtered down to my spring locking pin at Plant Denver, and we can see the inventory timeline, how that's progressing over time, and the stockout event that's happening in March. This is what I need to resolve. And I can see at hand, you know, everything I need, like where is this being used in production as, you know, production usage and when? Um, what's my availability? Do I have the opportunity to transfer material maybe from my plant at San Diego or my plant at Munich? Um, and then I can take action and simulate um, kind of in, in a parallel universe what happens if I take a specific action. So I'm going to take a look at San Diego because San Diego is the closest place to Denver that has a lot of inventory. And I can see that honestly at San Diego, I've got over 900 units for a while. So that's a good candidate to do a transfer order. And I'm going to execute that transfer order right here in my operational tool uh, that allows me to um, basically say, hey, we're gonna bring into Plant Denver from Plant Sa San Diego, my spring locking pin. And from here, I can you know, select an arrival date. Um, you know, it's gonna come in on the 28th, say, and we'll do 400 units. And um, you know, just for bookkeeping, we'll track what uh, my scenario name is. And, and once we apply this action, we can see in real time how every bit of the supply chain, upstream, downstream, how everything is impacted. And sure enough, my issues resolved. Um, and I can now go, you know, either push that back to the ERP uh, manually, programmatically, um, depending on the way my architecture is set up. But I really have that 360 degree view to operationalize the analytics and the hyper auto output. And with that, you know, I, I think that those are the main aspects that I kind of wanted to show around this, um, you know, how we layer on top the, the supply chain components to, to really bring everything full circle. We were able to get to this data asset within days and then deploy these kind of like what we call archetypes or common use cases on top of the data asset to go and solve these types of problems within an hour. So you can see how once we're connected to ERPs or multiple ERPs, like we can go and, and solve this type of problem very quickly. And then as I demonstrated, as Andy demonstrated, like this is what we kind of think about in terms of a white box solution. So I can understand the underlying logic that gets the data to this point in time, to that semantic layer, and I can change it and edit it and, and include the nuance of my business as I want. Uh, to, to go even further with that, the kind of like application or workflow that Andy went through is highly editable and configurable. That is just widgets that are, that are configured on top of that underlying data asset to expose a workflow to allow a more operational user to find that alert and ultimately go and solve it. So you can deploy that and then configure it and, and further, excuse me, further configure it to, to include the nuance or the strategy in terms of what you would like to do within uh, your organization. And the last thing that I think is like really, really important here is this ability to read data from the underlying ERP is not a one-way kind of like configuration. We both support 
reading data from and writing back uh, data to ERPs or other systems. So at the end of that workflow, once the kind of, you know, the operational user has made a decision and said, this is how I'm going to solve this issue. I'm going to get out of this jam. We can actually commit that back to the ERP system to make that stock transfer order happen or to make the purchase order happen or to make, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a different type of like action happen within that ERP. So that that is kind of like the interesting here is that like this whole end to end workflow is is highly configurable. It deploys within the matter of hours or days, highly configurable to include the nuance of your business, include other data as necessary, but then also uh, uh, allows for the ability to actually execute decisions both back to Foundry and that ontology, that semantic layer, as well as back to the ERP system itself.